Scott Pilgrim's back, and so am I. Seriously, please be good. Released all the way back in August of 2010, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, the game is a side-scrolling beat-em-up created as a tie-in for the movie based off the comics. A movie I liked a little too much as a kid because I saw it in theaters four times. This title is also pretty infamous for its removal from online stores four years after its release, back when delisting was rarer. This is a series called Nostalgia Drive, where I finish each and every game I left uncompleted as a kid. Now, it's been a while since I uploaded, but I have been working on stuff. Be sure to subscribe if you want to catch that video because it's been a long time in the making. But for now, I've been looking for an excuse to watch the new Scott Pilgrim show, so let's take a look at this game's achievements. As an arcade release, the base game has 12 achievements, but with two DLC adding three and four more achievements, our final total is 19. And this time around, I'm going to need them all because I've only ever played this game for like five minutes at a friend's house. The original achievements consist of Dirty Trick, Armed and Dangerous, and Vigilante, Shopaholic, an easy get with no effort required, New Challenger and Twin Dragons, Get the Girl, which we should be getting after our first run, Gourmet, Chow Down, and Invulnerable, which are a bit trickier than they seem. Then we can finish off with The Power of Friendship, and finally, One Man Army. As far as the DLC achievements go, we need to get It's All in the Reflexes, Speed Run, and Ninja Somersault from the Knives Chow add-on, as well as Wallace and Novice, Everybody Wants to Play, Velociraptor, and lastly, And It's a Wrap, all from the Wallace add-on. Now, the only obstacle stopping us from jumping straight into the game is how we should play it. I never actually owned this game, so as of right now, the only way I could play the 360 version of it is to transfer the game license from an account that does own it to the Xbox I'm intending on using to play. But that's against the terms of service. So today we're taking a different approach. This time around, I'm going to be using a re-release for newer generation consoles. It has the same exact 19 achievements, so it's basically the same. The only real difference that makes for this video is that we won't be getting the original hardware's achievement notification. That's why he's the GOAT! With that explanation out of the way, let's finally hop into the game. Starting off, I chose to play as Scott first for Get the Girl. It's a really straightforward achievement, but I wanted to keep things simple because I'm pretty bad at this game. Please don't tell me I'm bad at this. Yep. After inching my way through the first level at an absolutely glacial pace, I managed to button mash my way to defeating the first Evil X. Only to get a very swift game over in level two. That's when I found out this game is super, super forgiving. For starters, you don't immediately lose a life when your HP reaches zero. Instead, you get up a few times before it finally counts. On top of that, a game over only superficially hinders your progress by sending you back to the level select, where you just receive three more extra lives and can keep playing the game. Your character in the game does have stats that are completely independent from your level, strength, defense, willpower, and speed. I had originally thought that game overs penalized your stats in some way, but they don't. No matter how bad you are, you could theoretically get each of your stats up to the cap of 100 by slamming your head into the first stage over and over again. You can increase these stats by pretty much buying anything in the game. Some items only exist to increase your stats, but even health items tend to give you a small boost to a stat or two. And even if this game is totally out of your wheelhouse, you'd have to be absolute trash to suck with a maxed out character. Dude. This fight is infuriating. Oh. For my first playthrough, I wanted to get the game feeling a little more comfy, so I opted for the stage one face slamming strategy to at least get my speed up a bit. If I had to rank the stats in order of how important I think they are, it'd probably be speed, strength, defense, then willpower. It was only after two extra runs I got the achievement for fighting Matthew Patel without losing a life, which I wasn't even trying to do because I kind of forgot about it. This fight is actually really easy once you know where not to stand. Once it felt like my stats were cozy enough, I decided to jump into level 2 to see if all the grinding was worth it. And while it did help, it turns out the boss was a little bit easier than I thought it'd be. Oh, it's happening. Side note, I had a lot of bugs playing this game, but none of them cost me more than a few minutes of gameplay. Your mileage may vary, so be careful if you plan on playing this one yourself. Glitches aside, I started blasting through the next few levels. In the process, I was even able to get Dirty Trick, largely on accident because it was a little hard not to pick things up. By the time I got to the Katayanagi Twins in level 5, I was a little worried though. Since the first time I stopped to grind money, I had completely stopped spending any cash I had to save up for a big purchase that I'll explain in a bit. And because of that, this is where I started feeling the enemies outscale me a lot. The first half of the level is pretty easy, but the second half? 
gives you these guys. These guys. All they do is block, and I never found a single good way to deal with it. More often than not, the fastest way I ended up beating them was waiting for them to attack me so I could hit them with a counter. You can counter any attack in the game by just blocking at the perfect time, but most enemies attack so fast that it's only useful if you can read the attack rather than react to it. It took me a few times to get to the boss, but once I did, I found out the achievement Twin Dragons works a little differently than I thought. Rather than literally having to defeat them at the same exact moment, you get a massive window to defeat one twin once you down the other. You might be noticing by now that a lot of the bosses in this game are kind of chumps. Honestly, I think it's an intentional design choice in order to make the experience feel like more of an arcade game, where the focus would be to keep you spending your quarters by chipping away at your health rather than hitting you with a roadblock. At least until you hit level 7. Level 7 is uh, kind of rough. Luckily for us though, the twins level can be very fast and gives you a not too terrible amount of coins. So replaying it a few times didn't look like too bad of a way to grind out some extra cash. And now I should probably explain what I want it for. Back in level one, the first shop you come across in the entire game is called No Account Video. Here you're unable to buy anything unless you first pay off all of Scott's late fees. $500 is a bit of an investment, but it's massively worth it. While I do avoid guides so achievement hunting doesn't just become a boring checklist, I'm not going to pretend I didn't already know about the video store beforehand, making it the only thing I was ever worried about buying. Everything here is just about $5 a piece, and that's an insane bargain for what you're getting. The main two things we're worried about are the Mystical Head and the Seven Shaolin Masters. Mystical Head is a one-up taking you up to a maximum of nine lives, and every single Seven Shaolin Masters you buy is 10 points to all four of your stats. It's so cheap that with my change alone, I was able to completely max Scott out. With theoretically no way to lose, I felt pretty confident going back to the Chaos Theater. We still have 15 achievements left to go though, so I immediately jumped into a new playthrough as Wallace Wells with the goal of getting, and it's a wrap. This time opting not to grind for the video store. Seeing as how I still had to beat the game a few more times and one of those playthroughs was for a speedrun achievement, I wanted to start optimizing my playtime whenever I could. Now that I was used to the AI, the game felt pretty easy even without a max character. Throughout the second run, I did get the achievement Vigilante pretty early on, which means if you end up playing yourself, you can expect this achievement to pop at some point in your second playthrough. I only had to do a little bit of grinding to keep my health up, but this run was going way smoother than the last one, at least until I hit Gideon. Dude. Oh my god. I'm trying so hard not to get angry. The problem was me. I did not understand this boss fight, at least not yet. When I first played through with Scott, I kinda think I got lucky, standing in the perfect spot to maximize damage and accidentally dodging all of the worst attacks. Some things to note if you do plan on playing this yourself, watch your step. If you fall off the edge, I think you just lose the power of Love Sword. This edge in particular. What? I'm really not sure if there's any way you can get that sword back without resetting the level, but if you manage to learn the fight, or at the very least play until you get lucky again, his last phase is easy peasy. Now we can move on to our next character, Knives Chow. For this playthrough, I had a few goals. Firstly, I want to actually get her stats to 100 to make the speedrun achievement as simple as possible. Along the way, I want to also start cleaning up some other achievements I've been ignoring, like Shopaholic and Armed and Dangerous. Once I was done upgrading her, I had no issues beating the game. Especially now that I learned how to fight Gideon. It was here I started hyping myself up for my speedrun playthrough and something notable happened. I was a little worried that you might have to get this achievement on a fresh save for Knives, which would undoubtedly make this the hardest achievement in the game for me. Spoiler alert, you don't have to do this, but before I knew that I went into the settings to see if resetting a character was even possible. And that's when I noticed this. 
My entire time playing up to this point, I was positive the game had a bunch of secret levels because of the way the overworld map was designed. I had gotten this in my head because I still hadn't gotten gourmet despite buying out all of the shops I knew the locations of, so I figured this secret character was unlocked in one of those areas. I wouldn't find out until much later that there are no hidden levels and you actually get this guy by beating the game with every other character first. But one secret I did find after starting my speed run was a hidden boss. This is Mr. Chow. And while he isn't the toughest boss in the world, no amount of extra lives will help you. Um, that really sucks. I honestly didn't even know how I spawned him. A little dejected after getting my ass whooped, I returned to my speedrun where I was absolutely demolishing. Again, I'm not clear on how different the characters are, but a maxed out Knives feels way faster and easier to play than Scott or Wallace. It took me about an hour to get to the final level, which left me with plenty of time to get the achievement. It's not time to switch characters yet though, because I still had a few things to clean up. I spent more time than I care to admit looking for ways to get to these parts of the map that don't even exist, except for one. See, every level in the game has one shop that can be very easily found, not including the first one, which has many shops. The only outlier was level six, one of the levels that do have a little spot on it next to the map. As far as hidden areas go, this is the only one I ever ended up finding but it led me to a shop that finally got me the achievement Gourmet. Now all I had to do was get It's All in the Reflexes and Ninja Somersault, and I was free to move on. It's All in the Reflexes is actually a very simple thing to do. Knives automatically catches anything thrown at her while she's blocking, something I would have known if I literally ever blocked. All we gotta do for this is go back to level one and hold B. Getting 10 head stomps for Ninja Somersault, on the other hand, is a bit harder. You can get a head stomp at any time by hitting Y while in the air above an enemy, but only while they're standing up. That would be fine if it didn't always knock an enemy down. I first started trying this out on level 3 because this is where the enemies are the densest. The highest streak I ever got trying here was only 5 hits. It really didn't feel like I was on the right track with this method, so I decided to rethink my strategy. First, I went back to this section on level 5 to look for these guys again. I figured since they block 99% of the time that I could easily get back to back head stomps. And I wasn't wrong. Kind of. After getting 15 hits, I still had no achievement. So I guess that means you have to deal damage, otherwise it doesn't count. That leaves us with only two enemies in the entire game that don't block hits and can't get knocked down, making them the ideal targets for this achievement. The robot hands in level 5, and second phase Gideon. I don't think the hands have enough health to take that many hits, so Gideon it is. Six. Hold on. Hold on. I lost camp. This is definitely the right spot to do this. After getting this one, I decided it was time to knock out the multiplayer achievements next. Wallace the Novice and Everybody Wants to Play are quick, but only count if you finish the level. And doing that led to me getting surprised by the achievement Invulnerable. This shocked me because I really didn't think starting a level halfway through would count for this. With this, I was getting close to the 100% and I was hungry for it. So I quickly grinded out revives for the power of friendship and kills for Velociraptor. Shout out to my friends Slab and Snipe for getting on the game to help with these. That leaves us with only two achievements left to go, Chow Down and One Man Army. Chow Down is a much heftier achievement than it looks. Unlocking all the strikers is a weird one because as much as I've played the game, I didn't know what that meant yet. It turns out strikers are support skills that you can call in by hitting the left bumper, and each character has a different one. All the base game characters call in a unique version of Knives to do a different special attack, while Knives herself calls in her mother to scare off an enemy. At this point, the only thing I could think of doing was finding Knives' father again. Seeing as how her mother was a striker for her, it seemed like a pattern. I ended up playing level 3, the shortest one in the game, over and over again in order to spawn Mr. Chow. This took 40 minutes. Once he finally did show up, I took the fight very, very carefully. 
It was slow, but sure enough, this unlocks Mr. Chow as a striker. Although it didn't get me the achievement. Out of options, I had no other choice but to try to unlock the hidden character to see if they had an exclusive striker too. I said before you can do this by beating the game with each character, but I still didn't know that yet. By this point though, it was getting kind of obvious, so I put the new show on my second monitor and got to work. All three playthroughs took me a bit over four and a half hours to do, but after I was done, I got exactly what I wanted to see. I'll admit, I was a little bit disappointed there was no fight or fanfare to this unlock, but at the very least, it got me an achievement. All that leaves us with is One Man Army, an achievement that I honestly didn't know the difficulty of. Up to this point, I only ever had to play on average Joe, so jumping up to Supreme Master sounds very intimidating but I was about as ready as I could be. Halfway through the first level though, I had to stop because I honestly couldn't tell the difference. I actually restarted the game just because I thought I chose the wrong difficulty. Going from level one to level seven, I didn't even have to restock my extra lives. By the time I was at the Chaos Theater, I was starting to feel it a little bit, but the only thing that could stop me at that point was phase two Gideon. Oh, I'm sweating. I cannot lose this sword. Mm. Ooh, hold on. Oh, I got you now. Oh, I'm dialed in. Hell yeah. It's over. Bitch. From there, it was in the bag. Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, the game, was an amazing arcade game that I'm glad I took the time to play. It may have took me 14 years to play, but it was only 20-ish hours to finish overall. And it was well worth the time, so I'm very appreciative it got a re-release. Hopefully this time it doesn't go anywhere. Alright, this is the part of the video where I thank you for watching, but there's something I gotta say first. I mentioned at the top of the video that most of the time I wasn't uploading was spent on grinding for game shutdowns. If anyone cares for the full story, just let me know in the comments and I maybe wouldn't mind making a quick video to talk about it. But long story short, the 360 marketplace is shutting down soon. So for the time being, I'm going to be focusing on finishing multiplayer games while I still can, because server shutdowns are likely to follow. I can assure you guys though, I am alive and I got videos on the way. And of course, thank you for watching, especially to those who are still members like Mindless Actions, Banana Bread Sandwich, Colby Workman, and Ryan.